Hello, my name is Ben Jorgensen. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Constellation Network. And we're here today with my dear friend, Reihito Hatayama. He was a former global CEO of Sanrio, which is the parent organization of Hello Kitty. But his expertise and how he helps uh, Constellation is, is around uh, global strategy and marketing uh, with an emphasis on open innovation and community building in the entertainment industry. Um, so, you know, Ray, maybe an introduction to your background. Talk about maybe your association with Sony Entertainment, mm -hmm. your families in politics in Japan. Mm -hmm. Like, give us a little background on, on who sure. you are. Sure. So, I was born in Tokyo, uh, then uh, moved to Boston, and then uh, grew up in Sydney, Australia, moved back to Japan, uh, and uh, spent a teenager uh, and started working in Tokyo. But I have a certain like global background on myself. Uh, what was, ages were you when you were traveling from Tokyo to Boston? I mean, I was, can imagine you were open to a lot of new sites and yeah, that was impressionable. Yeah, four or five years old when I was in Boston and then six to nine when I was in Sydney, Australia and I moved back to Japan when I, I was 10. Jeez. Yeah. So you got to see a lot of uh, a lot of different cultures come together, a lot of new insights. Like how was that an, an impact on your your career? Uh, we've had these conversations on the side, mm -hmm. but we I know you as being this rebel. <laughs> and so how did this kind of rebel aspect mm -hmm. of you kind of start to be nurtured at these early stages? Yes, I think um, I was, since I was exposed to a lot of different kind of culture uh, in music and like uh, street culture to like education, I think I'm swallowing a lot of different kind of things. And also uh, I think I was open to living abroad. Mm -hmm. So my dream was always to go global. So when I decided to work, after the university, I joined the company Mitsubishi Corporation, which is a Where did you go to university? Uh, Aoyama University, which is a Japanese university. And then eventually I go to Harvard MBA. But like uh, after the first universal, uh, university experience, I chose the global con uh, conglomerate just because uh, I wanted to go global. But unfortunately, 10 years I was working on domestic market. <laughs> so I thought that I need to go out. So that's why I, um, you know, one of the chances I took was uh, going to MBA to have a, like, uh, yeah, well, my father went to Harvard Law School. So I wanted to go to the same school. Uh, and uh, I think uh, after uh, going uh, to the MBA, uh, I decided to join Sanrio and spend eight years of my life over there uh, working on Hello Kitty business. Well, before we jump into Hello Kitty, um, tell us a little bit more about how your family was a big part mm -hmm. of Sony. Your grandfather was one of the co-founders of Sony. Yes, uh, this, that's one of the reasons I'm living here uh, in Palo Alto, in Silicon Valley. So my grandfather was the head of R&D for Sony when it was established. And uh, on January 2nd, every founder of Sony, like Mr. Morita, Mr. Ibuka, uh, and my grandfather, they gathered together. They were talking about Sony making a sample to Bell Institution uh, about the Gulf War uh, transistor radio. And uh, they were that my grandfather was sending a lot of sample to them, uh, the radio of Gulf War. Uh, but uh, the ball was saying they never received a sample. And then uh, ultimately they found out that uh, Sony was sending the size of the Gulf War transistor radio. And at the time, nobody believed that that's going to happen. The small size Gulf War ra transistor radio is going to work. But uh, my grandfather told them to uh, switch it on and it worked. Wow. So, that, so that was uh, when uh, the Sony made the wow uh, moment uh, to the U.S. market. Uh, that was when they proved that they can do something different, uh, technology leading uh, with the product. So I think, um, yeah, I didn't understand what this meant, but after living here, uh, and especially after like, uh, working here uh, for Hello Kitty company, that was uh, in my heart saying that something you, you make an impact to this world uh, from Japan, to uh, the U.S. and the global, uh, which is something really exciting. So you, you, your family, if you kind of take back your DNA, you, your family took 
like ideas from the United States and brought them back to Japan to then globalize. And now you're coming, you're bringing ideas from mm -hmm. Japan and globalizing some of that, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I think uh, the bridging different kind of culture and I think a different background, yeah, so that's I think something uh, which sits on my back, uh, background. For example, my great grandfather was prime minister of Japan. He's famous for, uh, with his brother, opening up legal office uh, in Tokyo one of the first one and also got, he did his honeymoon to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can imagine that yes, uh, you go there by the yeah. ship. Yeah, a, I was just going to say. Yeah, so I think uh, that could have been innovative. Yeah, you know? and well, Japanese culture is really big in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that was very early on that that yeah, happened. And he did uh, Western style uh, wedding as well too. Oh, so, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So mm -hmm. why, do you, why do you think your whole family has been so keen to... I, I just think it's interesting that your whole family and your lineage uh, mm -hmm. bring... Uh, culture is such an important part in looking at different cultures and using that for innovation, to mm -hmm. spark innovation, whether it's in business or politics. I think uh, inspiration is uh, something very really important. Inspiration can come inside from you, but also it comes from outside as well too. Uh, if you mingle with a different kind of people, uh, with different kind of ideas, see not just uh, domestic market, but the overseas market, global market, you, you will have different kind of spark. And I believe that like, uh, new ideas, innovation, success co comes from those kind of factors. Uh, so I think uh, I'm really, I believe in open innovation and I believe in open sources. I'm experiencing myself uh, for being an open source as well too. <laughs> yeah, in Japan, How so? Uh, in Japan, you usually work in one company and sit in one company for 40 years until you retire. Uh, people don't change jobs. Meanwhile, because uh, I'm more independent, trying to be open source to many companies. For example, I'm on the board of like uh, three listed companies in Japan. One is the largest uh, social network online uh, with an uh, 8 billion market cap. Um, and, but uh, at the same time, I try to help startup uh, both in the US and uh, in Japan as well too. I help a lot of IP and entertainment companies uh, globally from here and some of the Asian company as well too. I help a lot of fashion brand as well too. Uh, I help a lot of technology brands. So I, I'm trying to be myself, uh, like representing open source myself. So you call it open source, but we um, could also say this is going back to your rebellious nature. Mm -hmm. Like you, you're synthesizing all these different cultural aspects to make up your own technology. Talk about more about how your rebellious nature has kind of brought these new ideas and why entertainment mm -hmm. is at the forefront of your of your kind of vision for the world. Yeah, probably that's because I was, uh, there was a time I felt I was isolated from the world, especially when I was going back and forth, uh, when I was more um, in the US, in Australia, in Japan. I was foreigner, uh, I was never a Japanese person. Yeah, even though I'm Japanese and going back to Japan because I couldn't really speak Japanese and write Japanese. And then uh, what, I, what I went into was the culture. And uh, the 90s was the culture of hip hop, heavy metal, uh, and the culture of the mixture. So you, uh, one of the important moments for me was the first time I listened to Walk This Way of Aerosmith and Run DMC. It was a mixture of rock, heavy metal, and uh, the black culture, which is hip hop. Which and, is totally separate. Exactly. And then you see uh, Beastie Boys running into those culture as well too. Uh, and the mix, all the, all the mixture of James Brown into not just hip hop, but also into like dance music. So I think um, I saw those kind of crossover. And also you see those kind of crossover going into Japanese music industry. So there was a band called Tiny Punks. Yeah, they were really a punk band, but uh, moved into DJs and like uh, electric music as well too. So I think uh, I saw those kind of crossover in music and I was so into it. And then like uh, those culture was close into uh, the fashion as well too. So Run DMC was uh, really big on Adidas. 
uh, mm -hmm. superstar. Right. So uh, that made into uh, the culture and the dance as well too, and also to like skateboarding, the sports. Uh, so I think um, I was into a lot of different kind of things. So these were like the early influencers, and this was the early attempt to kind of bridge communities together to evangelize uh, bigger movements and brands. Right, yes. Yeah. So, so I think at that time, yes, uh, it was a something small start. But if you see right now, that's the major culture. Like uh, if you see, for example, the fashion industry right now, the trend is to mix uh, the luxury into sports uh, or uh, the street culture. Kim Jones uh, in Dior and Louis Vuitton, they do those kind of things. But I've already seen those kind of things happening in the 90s uh, or later 80s in Japan. So uh, I think a mixture is uh, the kind of the core uh, value I really appreciate on that. How do you see this mixture starting to play its role with uh, new technologies and new platforms like, like blockchain technologies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the good way to I think uh, explain about it is, is my experience on Hello Kitty. Uh, so go, when I started Hello Kitty, it was 2008. Uh, nobody really saw Hello Kitty as something popular uh, for the old generation or for luxury or for fashion. But uh, I already seen a sign of, for example, like Paris Hilton liking uh, Hello Kitty, like, and also like uh, Mariah Carey, like Katy Perry, they liking Hello Kitty, uh, and it wasn't just for kids. So one of the things I crossed over was the fashion. So I went. So back. when you came back, when you came into Sanrio, it was two thousand and eight. The company was really marketing itself towards kids, right? right? And it was massively in debt. Is that right? Right. So the market cap at the time was five hundred million, and uh, and it was almost like uh, bankrupting. So it was not a good time. Yeah, many people yeah told me not to join that company. Oh no. Yeah, but fortunately, when and you the, came in as what was your role at at uh, Sanrio? Yeah, initially I was the COO of US operation. But ultimately, in three years, I became the global COO for uh, the, all the operation. And uh, I was the strategy and like marketing uh, officer for the headquarters as well, too. Excellent. So when you came into Sanrio, uh, not, a, not to interrupt what you were saying earlier, but um, what were some of the things that you saw that they weren't doing and you saw an opportunity to put your vision of open networks in. Can you talk more about like the things that you saw kind of wrong, but the things that you saw as the opportunity and that were exciting to you? Yeah, so uh, I think um, there were a couple. One was the sign that it can be really uh, big in other global markets, uh, but at the same time, you should see the operation it was centralized to Tokyo, Japan. So they didn't see that opportunity or they couldn't really utilize that opportunity how to expand other territories or other, I think, uh, categories. So one of the things I really focused was decentralizing the decision making and open up to the community of Hello Kitty for licensees, uh, for the tech companies or the apparel and brands. Uh, how I did that was, I think, basically, I think um, the idea of the open innovation. So uh, initially, yeah, there was certain designers from Japan uh, who control all over the... How many did you say, like 50? Uh, they are like an internal 50, but in reality, I think there was a more limited, right. uh, especially if you just uh, think about Hello Kitty. And, but uh, the point is you centralize in Tokyo and have a style guide and you, uh, you put that style guide into every territory. But instead, the decentralizing thing is you put like a local office responsible for Hello Kitty design. And also from the local office, you uh, create a network of different kind of like licensees uh, in local area to create Hello Kitty designs. It's not just about design, it's about the product as well too, what kind of product uh, Hello Kitty should have. Uh, just to remind you that like, if you think that Hello Kitty is just for kids, then you only have a kid's product. Meanwhile, uh, I've saw like the, the teenagers liking to have the jewelries 
or like sometimes cosmetics, uh, or sometimes art piece, or sometimes not just for uh, females and girls, but somebody for boys. The Kiss collaboration is one of the good example, and like uh, collaboration with Beijing Ape and other cover, uh, those are for street fashions. So you can see uh, a different kind of audience liking Hello Kitty when you expand those kind of uh, products. Can you talk a little bit about your, your process into taking a traditional company like Sanrio and opening them up to the idea of open innovation? What was your process of getting people on board with you? Because that's a big shift. You're talking uh, relinquishing control mm -hmm. to the entire world to reinvent your brand. Yeah, I think um, I was lucky. There was uh, two two fundamental things. One was I think uh, the environment in Sanrio was a challenge, something new, just because the company was not in good shape. So I think uh, there was an opportunity to really do something good. And also I think uh, I was lucky enough to be the CEO of the U.S because it's not the headquarter. Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, having different kind of home from your parents. And sure. so you can do something really free over there. Yeah. So, uh, I actually, so <laughs> Back to your rebellious nature, right? Like, right, so okay. actually you didn't need to ask. You just needed to do it. Yeah. Yes, and I probably didn't ask so much. I just did it. And but that's not very Japanese, right? That's uh, not really, that, that comes from your mix of cultures from traveling the world. Probably. I, I think uh, I was comfortable taking those kind of risks, but I was at the same time confident that I can make certain success on doing that. So I was never worried about it. We got to the point that um, you entered a company that was kind of crippled. They were open to like any idea to get them out of where they were. So then what was your next plan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there was uh, two different kind of things, I think, uh, expanding the category. So one, one of the focus was uh, going back to Silicon Valley and technology. So uh, fortunately or unfortunately, yes, I was located here because U.S. headquarters for Sanrio was in South San Francisco. Sure. Yeah, and it was close enough to tech companies in Silicon Valley. So I started working with a lot of tech companies. At that time, there was lots of like uh, Facebook application companies uh, and like mobile app companies. Uh, we started to do that. And also, uh, it was a start of uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and I was using those kind of tools. So why don't we have like a Hello Kitty account? Yeah, official ones. And then like those kind of things, I think uh, you see them grow. And this, this was early, there was n nothing, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. And you grew right. the social awareness. Like talk more about how you, you tapped into early communities mm -hmm. like social platforms to build the brand and what did that what did that look like what were well, yeah so it was like 2008 2009 2010 sure. yeah so very early uh, stage of social network so uh, one of the things i try to do is not to judge those platforms so you should start uh, doing those kind of platform and also applying those technologies just because you you don't know what what's going to happen I think that's, uh, I think, uh, the idea of the open innovation. You don't judge yourself. You, you make a judgment by the result or uh, by having response for the community. So uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, we were not sure how it's going to end. Or... It sounds a lot like blockchain technology in the blockchain industry, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, you just need to employ those kind of things and uh, see how it goes. I think the judgment ultimately is made by the community or the fan. Uh, other way to say it's the fans or the people who is going to utilize that or, or benefit from that. So it, it, my approach was not to really judge uh, from the company side, uh, but uh, opening up and uh, make uh, those licensees or the partners uh, see how they use. And then uh, like, uh, appreciate that and uh, start from there. So you, you actually, your idea spread so much that you had more followers than the Kardashians, you said. Yes, yeah, at that time, yes. I, I haven't followed that since then, so yeah. But yeah, so we had 13 million, yeah, so when, yeah, Kardashians had less. Yeah. <laughs> so this is pretty fascinating. You looked at um, where the fans were and to try innovation with an, with an open mind. Mm -hmm. And what were some of the results that you guys see? I mean, talk about where your company went in revenue mm -hmm. uh, during that time that you can correlate kind of revenue to awareness mm -hmm. of, 
uh, of the brand? The big, uh, uh, I think, uh, the benchmark was the market cap. Sure. So, uh, uh, from 500 million market US dollar company, it became 6.5 billion in, in four years. Wow. Yeah, 13 times larger. Yeah. Jeez. Yes, and that's by accessing a community. Talk about like what that, like how did that viral sensation pick it up? I know you're big on influencers. Mm -hmm. Talk more about what unleashing that power did. I think uh, it, it was a combination of like uh, open innovation and uh, really building up the business platform uh, under that. So I think. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, for example, like digital, uh, it, it's not what sits in Sunreal because it's uh, like merchandising company, toy company, but the utilizing, for example, like uh, one of the companies in Japan is Line, it's a social network, you do stamping, and that's kind of the revenue uh, you can have. And those kind of things uh, become a new revenue stream. Or, yeah, if you think of, like Sanrio as a toy company, it's very difficult to do fashion. But uh, when you partnership with H&M, Zara, Gap, or like a Diesel, or like some, uh, some brand as well too, you penetrate different kind of market mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. you get a share. Uh, so I think, uh, for example, in, in the US market, ultimately, yeah, so I think Hello Kitty's uh, market size was uh, really small, like, uh, couple hundred million in the lower end, it became like uh, closer to two billion. So that's the kind of the market size you have. Uh, but at the same time, since we were doing that in licensing model, we didn't need to grow the revenue, uh, the market sales. Uh, actually, yeah, when I was in San Rio, the sales went down, but the profitability went up. Yeah, so the EBITDA went up. Wow. So, so I think I think it's pretty interesting that you tapped into these open networks and community. You essentially looked at. So I'll, I'll take a step back and say, uh, you know, with the blockchain industry, there's a the range of partnerships that are used to explore real world use cases and offer validation. And one of the things that Constellation is trying to do is push partnerships to drive um, innovation, validation, but also what not to do. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm hearing from you, you worked for a company that was a public company. You looked at open innovation as a, and new partnership models to see not only how do we expand broader markets, but what not to do. Can mm -hmm. you talk about some of the things on like what you learned and what not to do mm -hmm. as well as what you did, right? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, there were certain things which uh, Sanrio and Hello Kitty didn't want to do, yeah, which was, I think, uh, the hurt, hurting people or something related to, I think, violence or like drugs. Those are the things uh, we tried to uh, pull out from. But other than that, I think... Uh, how did, and how did you know to pull back from that? Was it leveraging the community? Uh, I think uh, it's both ways. Uh, you don't yeah, approve those kind of things, but at the same time, I think the community doesn't like that, those ideas too. So when, when those kind of ideas fly into, I think, the market or the community, I think, uh, I think they overreact as well, too. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting point. As we build our brand in Constellation, we, we tend to look at the community mm -hmm. for governance as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the same way, you, at a very early stage, mm -hmm. applied that to entertainment to use the community to guide your mm -hmm. your product and branding and open that, that opportunity, right? Yeah, uh, I think um, opening up sometimes give you more governance. Uh, I think uh, like uh, open in innovation, good example is Wikipedia. Initially when it started, uh, nobody really believed on what's on Wikipedia. Uh, since everybody is watching right now, uh, reviewing now, uh, right now, adding right now, it's more than a dictionary on a real-time basis. Sure. And that kind of, I think, uh, I think uh, database open source uh, is done by community. Uh, and it has its own governance, uh, but it's working. If you really open up to the community, there are people uh, who are going to govern that. Yeah, I sure. think, uh, it, it, yeah, I think uh, that, that's ultimately what's, uh, what happened with Hello Kitty as well too. And then you took that community feedback and understanding the brand and said, how do I go out to some influencers to validate my product mm -hmm. towards those different verticals, mm -hmm. right? Who are some of the people you worked with to kind of build out those channels and awareness? Mm -hmm. uh, so people, I think, uh, 
to begin with, uh, those who are in the community really love Hello Kitty. So they don't want to hurt Hello Kitty. They want to do something great with Hello Kitty. And uh, as I mentioned, like uh, designers internal with uh, with Sanrio as a company is limited to like 50, uh, maybe up to 100 people globally. But then uh, when you open up to the community, for example, open up the community with the licensees, we're talking about not like a tens and hundred companies, thousands of companies you're talking about. And then in one company, they have another like 50 or 100 designers, wow. maybe one as well too. But many of them have lots of, uh, not only designers, but who's expert in developing merchandising or doing marketing. So there's tons of idea. So the network you're talking about is tens of thousands. Uh, multiplied by like, uh, tens of different ideas. So uh, I think the degree of innovation or new ideas of Hello Kitty is it's like really like thousands and thousands and thousands and millions and millions and millions in the long term. Meanwhile, if it was a closed, uh, closed opportunity for just for internal, then like uh, releasing like 10 design or maybe like uh, 100 design, that's something we were good at. But I think uh, once again, open innovation is to really uh, de develop those kind of networks together with the community and the designers, uh, not only design, again, with marketers, product development, business models. Yeah, business models. And then you have tons of ideas. I, I think that that's incredible. And I would also say that, and, and maybe kind of to, to cap this off is that, um, open innovation requires a level of humility as a character trait because not everything is going to be right. And as a centralized organization, mm -hmm. you weren't able to, to be agile and innovate and improvise and fail. Like part of innovation is failing, right? Mm -hmm. I think uh, failing is not a bad thing. Uh, sometimes you need to test it out. And so some products of Hello Kitty yeah, definitely didn't work. But at the same time, yeah, but innovation crossovers that. Yeah, there are certain things which works uh, very well as well too. Uh, it's more like a try and error. And once again, I think the market and the community will decide what's going to be successful. It's a little bit challenging, but at the same time, uh, to be really calm on the result uh, is very important. Otherwise, new products doesn't come out. Well, I, um, I would like to segue a little bit in taking this open innovation and open network side of things into why why you saw blockchain interesting and specifically why you came to work, advise Constellation. Um, and we talked about this when we first met. You had a whole vision around how Constellation uh, is leveraging open networks to be mm -hmm. the VMware. Could you talk mm -hmm. about like what VMware mm -hmm. did that was so revolutionary mm -hmm. and how it correlates to open networks and what Constellation is doing? There are a couple things I think uh, which is important things uh, or like uh, exciting things uh, I saw in Constellation. So one is I think uh, when I first introduced the internet, that was my blowing my mind. Uh, and uh, people didn't know how to use the internet. Right. Everybody uses it right now. Yeah. Uh, so, and once again, yeah, how to use the, for example, skateboard. People didn't know it. Everybody knows it right now. Right. So I think, um, yeah, in my, uh, in, in, in my mind, yes, uh, like internet, like skateboard, or like uh, mixer culture, and like blockchain technology, it's all the same thing. It's a component where like, you, know, you see something revolutionary. Uh, and I, I see a big opportunity on this technology bringing something to the next level. And I think this uh, blockchain technology can be something in the middle, uh, which will bridge uh, the current industry, uh, how to decentralize uh, on controlling things or how to like, monetize and like uh, and do transaction, like uh, how to really use the big data source. Uh, there's no like middle layer things uh, that's doing that. Like, and I think uh, in the old days, uh, 
when there was a PC and like uh, microchips and like uh, operation system and application, uh, there were a lot of different kind of layer uh, which was not connecting. And uh, one of the things I saw was VMware virtual machine layer, uh, trying to talk about OS layer and application. And I think that led many different kind of ideas to fly uh, in terms of, I think, hardware and software. Uh, and, and so I think um, like blockchain technology uh, is something in the middle layer where you can explore a different kind of industry, different kind of mixture with different kind of, I think, services. That's, I think, ultimately what you're going to see. And I think uh, what I was excited was like uh, your vision, Constellation's vision, uh, visions and technology are yeah, trying to solve those kind of uh, problems with the futuristic vision. That's what I loved. Well, great, thank you. I mean, for the, and, and incorporating scalability because you've seen, and advising a lot of companies, and you can't mm -hmm. say this, but mm -hmm. uh, specifically, but you've seen a lot of blockchain technologies just not work. Can you talk a little bit more of what you've seen out there mm -hmm. and, and maybe how we're trying to fix that gap and that's mm -hmm. what excited you? Yes, I think um, there's a lot of different kind of application right now. Uh, of course, uh, there's a lot in entertainment. There's, I think, uh, fintech and security. You see a lot of things uh, and also in the communication layer as well, too. Uh, or uh, some people try to use that for, uh, I think, uh, user generated content or like more, more on the open uh, platform side as well too. What I'm seeing now is a lot of challenge. Uh, and once again, I go back to the open innovation as well too. Uh, I think um, right now I see a lot of uh, things happening on the vertical integrated side, uh, but I think the idea of Constellation is to bring that into the community and test and uh, try and error on what kind of things works and bring that uh, community into like freely using your tools uh, is one of the key success. That's, that's awesome to hear and that's, that's what we, uh, we believe down deep inside mm -hmm. as well is, and, and look at not only how our community mm -hmm. can help build a future for us mm -hmm. by using new technologies but also how to govern an, mm -hmm. an open network for the future. Yeah. Much like you did at Hello Kitty, you mm -hmm. kind of took that from a, a brand and license and an entertainment perspective, you see the same trend happening within these blockchain communities. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, yeah, it's easy to say like blockchain and like fintech blockchain uh, and like entertainment, but I think it's going to be much more complicated than that. And you see it more as this middleware of processing data, much like VMware, versus simply a financial instrument. Right, yes. So, you know, kind of finishing this off, I would love to hear a couple of things of what we should avoid uh, in building this and a couple of things that we should embrace as a, a community in building this. Constellation as a community, I think, uh, yeah, everybody shouldn't judge too much. Uh, just because I think, uh, once again, we want to elaborate on open network, open source, like Linux and uh, the other uh, Wikipedia and others did. So I think uh, it's really important to like see how it goes uh, and uh, elaborate on different kinds of ideas with different kinds of people. I think yeah, with mixture of all kinds of things, that's very important. Sure. Uh, and. On the operation side, uh, I mentioned that I try to be open as much. Yeah, but if you are really building something on that platform, you need to be biased. <laughs> and this is a contradic uh, contradiction, but like uh, as I mentioned, I'm, uh, I try to utilize uh, Hello Kitty as like an open platform, but I was biased toward, for example, like fashion. Mm. So I believe in that, so I use that. Uh, on fashion collaboration with like Nigo and like uh, Jun Takahashi and like uh, um, different kind of things uh, and like uh, celebrity marketing as well too because I was biased toward that. Yeah, bias is a one way to say, but I think it's the belief. Uh, and belief in yourself and your own vision. Right, and following exactly. Through with that right, yeah, heart. exactly. And uh, it, fortunately, it worked well. Sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't, but I think. Um, Yes, I think uh, when you are utilizing these kind of new technologies, to a certain extent, you need to have a bias of your own and believe in that 
and go through with it. Well, any other closing remarks, Ray? Yes, uh, I think, um, yes, one of the things I want to uh, stress is, like, Ben, uh, I love you. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, I love you too, yeah. <laughs> So we talked about the business model and yeah. all those kind of things, uh, the, like, future of open innovation and blockchain. But at the same time, uh, the first thing I see is person. Yeah. So well, I, I only work with the person I like. Oh, uh, thanks, feel man. passion and share the passion together. So otherwise, I think uh, I wouldn't be here. Yeah, so I think uh, it all started from you. Ah, Ray, I can't, I mean, that gives me chills, man. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, our friendship has uh, blossomed out of this, this business relationship. So I, I can't thank you enough. And for your words are so kind, man. It's been an honor to have you a part of this journey and uh, building out this future. And you've helped catapult this uh, our entire brand and vision and provided corporate governance so um, thank you so much and and thank you for your your insights and your kind words so sure. thank you thank you thanks everyone thank you